For all of our returning listeners, thank you so much for joining us once again here at the Intellectual Podcast. Your continued support of the show is greatly appreciated. If you're a new listener, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. And if you haven't already, please make sure that you subscribe to the Intellectual Podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio or Stitcher or Google Play Music. Uh, wherever it is you're consuming the Intellectual Podcast, please make sure that you subscribe. And if you feel so inclined, please give us a rating and a review. Uh, your ratings and reviews help us out tremendously, and uh, we appreciate it when you take the time to Drop us the line and give us some feedback. And um, we do this for everybody. We bring all this content to you for free. And uh, your continued support through subscriptions, uh, which are also free, um, and through reviews and ratings on the various uh, podcasting platforms, uh, really helps us continue to produce the show and keep things moving forward for you, our listeners. You know the old saying, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. That phrase is incredibly true in our business. In entertainment, your first impression can mean everything. It can mean the difference of booking a job or not booking a job, having an audition or not having an audition. That first impression can get you in the door and make things happen. And for an actor, that first impression is the headshot. First and foremost, casting directors, producers, they're going to see your headshot and they're going to make decisions about whether or not you get seen based on that one image. So it's incredibly important to make that image an investment in your future. And to do that, you want to find the right photographer, someone who's going to work with you to craft the perfect image, the perfect first impression. And I suggest you check out portraitsbypeggy.com. Peggy's been doing photography since the 80s, and she really knows her stuff. And she wants to work with you to craft the perfect captured image, the one that captures the uniqueness of you and helps you book the job. She wants to work with you. She wants to really get into who you are, what sort of jobs you're trying to book, and help you get the perfect image. So check out PortraitsByPeggy.com and book your portfolio session today. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The Intellectual Podcast starts now stuff like that yeah well you know it's um it's all well and good to stand by artistic integrity and everything else but you know if you can't pay your bills yeah right you ultimately. don't get to do the art yeah exactly. <laughs> right yeah. So there's got to be a balance between the two so. yeah ultimately that's what it is right i mean it's we're all we do live in a capitalist society <laughs> so we have to make money and we just have to be responsible adults who meet their obligations. Well, the other thing is you also want to you also want to get as many people as you can to watch and appreciate your art. Yeah. So that just in, inherently is marketing. Yeah, that's a good point. That's just what it is, you know. So you kind of have to know how to do that, yeah. or find somebody who does. <laughs> well, you hear actors complain all the time. Oh, I got to get new headshots. I got to do this. Oh, well, I got to do this all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, because. You have to advertise you. Yeah, you are the product. <laughs> Nobody else can advertise you, but you like. Mm -hmm. You know, can't can't just expect that stuff to happen. Right. <laughs> it's got to be done. You got to go out and do it. And we are constantly changing and evolving human beings. Right. Hair changes. Right. It yeah. Gets more gray. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you lose a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things happen. You don't look the same. <laughs> so hair yeah. have to get updated. I really like your pen. Thank you. I love pandas. <laughs> you're good. You're a good city for it. I do love Apparently. pandas. Apparently, yeah, this is a, a this is a panda city. You're yes. City yes. Is it? Yeah. San Diego Zoo is like they're, one they're of the most pandas. successful panda breeding operations. in the country. It's like their mascot. The oh, guys! It's Whoa. like a big deal, yeah. and they're so beautiful, and I cry when I go see them. Of course, you I do. love them so much. All right, so we oh, wanna... that's why the baby panda. Now, uh, I, yep, get now yeah, yeah. get now I get it. Now you get it. Now I get it. Shall we do some introductions? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So we are here with Eric Casolini and Jennifer. I did not actually catch your last name. Jennifer. Lane. Jennifer Lane. Jennifer Lane. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, you're a writer for The Fringe Show? I am, yes. I'm the playwright. Excellent. Do you what, guys... What is The Fringe Show that you're doing? It's called To Fall in Love with Anyone, Do This. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds like something I should watch. <laughs> Inspired by the uh, New York Times article of the same name um, about the 36 questions that scientists say will make you fall in love with anyone. 
Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah. I remember hearing about that like uh, last year sometime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it went viral a couple of times actually. Yeah, um, and there was also wasn't there? A, there was something on NPR. There I was think. a podcast. Is that what um, it was? I think someone read the article. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it went around twice because of the article, and then maybe it and wasn't then the podcast. on NPR. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it definitely had um, it had some some a lot of attention, uh, and I mean I, I don't want to tell your part of the story, but I mean it sounded, the way I understand it is you became pretty fascinated with the concept, and then yeah. and then what? Uh, th- well, yeah, I was first really excited by the science behind it, just the idea of being able to sort of scientifically replicate the process of falling in love. Um, but it was mostly that I had the, the article in my head for a really long time and I was working on another play that just was just not a very good play. It just was not a very good play. (laughs) And, um, well it wasn't. And so, and, but this thing was like nagging at me in the back of my head. And so I put down this other play that wasn't very good that I was on deadline for, um, and worked on the first draft of To Fall in Love and it just came out very quickly. How, it it wasn't like. A couple of days. It was three days, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Came out in three days. That's awesome. Pretty fast process, yeah. So, and then how did you guys come together in this project? Well, so we've worked together before, um, two years ago now, mm-hmm. right? There, yeah. There's a, um, I guess it's a, a sort of a playwright festival. at. Um, it's called Out on a Limb. It's at uh, Scripps Ranch Theater. <laughs> and um, I had... I got connected through them. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm friends with Candace Paul. Her husband, um, uh, Robert uh, May, mm-hmm. uh, is the producer of Out on a Limb. And she connected me with him to do – they have a whole process of how they pick the plays that they're going to produce. What they, they, so they invite people to come write a play. Uh, it was one act. Uh, and then they go through a process of, of narrowing down which three or four they're going to produce. And so through that process, I was asked to be a reader – during that, where they have like dramaturgy, and and I think you were there too, yeah. weren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we met during that process, and then I ended up getting cast in the play that that was ex- her play, Jenny's play, that was accepted, called September and Her Sisters, and then that was for the fourth year of Out on a Limb, yes. which was two years ago, and then last year for the for the fifth year anniversary, they did a special where they asked two playwrights from the previous four years to expand their one act into one act into a full length play. Oh, wow. So we redid September and her sisters full throttle, <laughs> full throttle <yeah. laughs> um, at, at a full length, you know, two, two act structure with um, mostly it was 75% of the same cast right, of, just of the one, four of us. One yeah. different character. So yeah, yeah. So we've worked together a couple times and then she came to me, Jenny came to me telling me about this, to fall in love concept because I wrote it with his voice in my head. That's why. I mean, I wrote it for him. <laughs> that so <laughs> actually blew my mind. Like I'd never <laughs> experienced that before. It was the most incredible feeling to like when you read it. Hear that? Did you hear yourself in it? You know what's funny? I was I, the, when she so she told me that before I read it, and then I and I was it, it, so it was like humbling and, and exciting and, and weird all at the same time to hear that. And then I went home and, and read it, and I was like amazed <laughs> at how good she is at listening to people because there were definitely parts where I was like, that's easily something that would just fall out of my mouth. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> the answer to your question was, do yeah, you, I could. Do you often picture people, you know, voicing the words for characters? Is that how I, you differentiate the, some, the I think dialogue? sometimes I do it. There are a few actors I've written for specifically because their cadence is just very, distinctive in some way in my head. And um, so I've only done it a few times, but I find that when I do write for specific actors, the, the work is stronger right out of the gate. Yeah. And like it, it requires less tweaking line by line because the rhythm of their, how they speak is much more realistic because otherwise it's all just going to kind of sound like me in the first draft, yeah. which is fine for one character, but not several. <laughs> it's, well, it, unless you're Kevin Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's, That's very know? true. Now, when I write, yeah. I, I, I don't necessarily write for a particular actor, but I always try to envision somebody unique. Oh, yeah, that's, that's smart. Um, even if it's just another actor from film and TV that I like, like I try and picture them in, in a role while I'm writing it. Mm-hmm. And that seems to help me. Mm-hmm. Keep them from all sounding like me. Yeah, which is dry. I feel like that's really musical too, for some mm. reason. Or like that's, that's something I've never asked you before, Jenny. Are you 
Are you musical? I have, a, yeah, I have a background in music. I have 13 oh, years of classical piano. Yes, yeah. we did talk about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So that <laughs> makes sense to me. wasted on me now. I have a, oh, like, yeah. No, but that's what I'm saying, no, is that it's not. Exactly. That's true. Yeah, yeah. that's true. There's rhythm to dialogue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And finding, finding the musicality of each individual character is, yeah. is really important. Yeah. So how did you get involved in writing? Did you go to school for it or was it just something that you found one day? You're like, hey, I enjoy this. I'm good at it. <laughs> well, I, I was always that kid with the notebook and the book at all times. So I think that there's part of part of the story is I've been doing it forever because I always had a notebook with me. But I did go to school for it. I went uh, to Sarah Lawrence for undergrad and I focused on acting, which I'm a terrible actor. So it's good that I'm not doing that anymore. Acting and fiction. And then I came kind of late to playwriting. I took a playwriting class as part of a prerequisite for the theater department at Sarah Lawrence. And I was like, ooh, it's fiction and acting together. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then... Uh, you can be an actor in your mind. Exactly. I can be all the people. I can be all the characters in the story, <laughs> not just one, and usually a very small part. So um, I took to it very quickly, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I took two years off, and then I went to Columbia for graduate school in playwriting. So that's my, my and background. Then? How'd you migrate out here? Oh well, so I came out here. <laughs> I came out here <laughs> about four years ago now um, because of a failed relationship. Mm. But to be fair, I needed to get out of New York um, at the time you anyway. Just need that person to be the excuse. Yeah, yeah. It fell apart super fast after I got out here, which is for the best. Mm -hmm. And um, and it it. I think I really just I was burnt out in New York City. Um, I was working. I mean, just insane hours a just trying town. yeah it's really hard i spent a month there last year and it felt like i'd been there for a year yeah a few days <laughs> i loved can, it but it yeah, felt it's like great. i'd been there a year i'd been there like 18 days that yeah. might have to do with like at, at least three of those days i know like we didn't sleep at all like it was just working well, was working working yeah the i was at the whole time i was there well there you came go out the podcast with me for like a day and a half <laughs> and it's just insane. It was podcast yeah. after podcast, mm -hmm. train after train after train. Mm -hmm. Watched a play, watched a soccer game, podcast, podcast into like two in the morning, and then like trains and crash up in the morning back into town. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Though. That's, that's the that's, constant that's, rhythm. Yeah, just constantly moving. It's, and I feel like it's, it's invigorating to a certain point. But I can yeah. see how it would wear you. Yeah, down. and then yeah, because I was there for about ten years, and I was like, uh, I, I needed, I needed a change of pace. And, and the thing You're is, actually only eighteen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it aged me so significantly. <laughs> and now you look 25. Aw. 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 Yeah. I see why you keep getting rolls. I, <laughs> I was hoping one of you guys would, would not catch that and say it out loud. <laughs> I'm a director. I watch everything. Yeah. <laughs> so now, Eric, what is your background? Are you born and raised in California? Where'd you come from? No, actually, I'm, I'm East Coast, born and bred, uh, Jersey boy. Uh, grew up outside of D.C. My father's from New York. My mother grew up in Boston. So the East Coast thing is really strong for me. Um, and I was up and down the eastern seaboard after, uh, for and after college. Um, I ended up in New York as well for a little while. Um, my undergraduate degree took me there. Um, I did an internship in technical theater in, in New York. And, and, um, and then from there, uh, I traveled down to Virginia, was there for a little while, hung out with my brother, played music, uh, with him and his, his now wife. They what were part dating. of Virginia? Oh, um, Charlottesville. That's where I went to Get yeah, out of grad town. school, Charlottesville. UVA town. Yeah. yeah cool. Is that where you went? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What yeah. years were you there? So 2011 to 2014. Right on. Yeah, I was there. Um, I got there actually in August of 2001 and was there for two years. And then uh, uh, I had the good fortune. This is really uh, one of the coolest moments of my life. I had the good fortune to meet. Um, well, actually, if you want the real answer to your question, I won't go into that story. So let me, let me back up. <laughs> so my undergraduate degree is in English, right? Um, and uh, I like how when he goes English. <laughs> <laughs> My undergraduate is in English. Well, you know, that's, I did study English literature. Um, I have a lot of tweed from back in the day. <laughs> Elbow patches, for sure. Yes. And actually, that 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 is, if we were already there, that would lead right into this play. Oh actually. yeah, you're gonna have to bust out that tweed for costuming. No question. Yeah. Well, it's already in the in the artwork. Oh, it that is. That is a tweed jacket. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, okay. Anyhow, to finish answering the question, 
Uh, they didn't have a drama program when I was an undergrad. I went to the University of Delaware. And wow, I'm surprised nobody busted out a. Uh, uh, in Delaware. Yes, that, that's, that's exactly. Where are we? Yeah, we're in Delaware. Delaware. Uh, One fabulous. of my friends from UVA went to the University of Delaware. So. It's actually a really great school. It was I was fun. just resisting the urge to I know. I was just waiting for. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, it was that Wayne's World, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, but they had a really good graduate program. Uh, so I was I was surprised they didn't have one. So uh, anyhow, I, I ended up getting an internship um, in technical theater, which I didn't even expect to get. It was a, a, a whimsical application that turned into something really spectacular. So I ended up going to the Juilliard School for a year. Um, and... Uh, now that it's come up, actually, Jenny did her fellowship there as well. So yeah. we have that in But in, in the drama division office, not in technical theater. Right. But we know some of the same people. Mm-hmm. Through, what year were you there? The, I was there. So I left in August of 2001 for Virginia. So okay. I was there for whatever, 99 to 2000 school oh, okay. year. Okay. So um, so I, I, I had an interest in, in performing since I was a kid, but um, I didn't really get the chance to until I was in college. And then, you know, so I was doing like, you know, student union type stuff. Um, student run uh, performing. And so, um, and then I, I put it down for a while, lived a life, you know, that just didn't feel right for a long, long time, uh, was married, uh, split up. And the, literally the moment, I mean, within a week of splitting up, I sent my headshot and resume to San Diego State because uh, I knew they had, a, uh, uh, you know, a film program there where they did independent filmmaking. And I just said, hey, I'd, I'd love to, to get the opportunity to work with some of your, your filmmakers so I could get some you know, some time on screen and practice. Cause I'd done a lot of stage, but I, I'd always wanted to focus on film. So I started focusing on this about three and a half years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just been a part of my sort of, uh, waking and dreaming life forever. Like I've just always thought cinematically. It's just mm-hmm. part of who I am. Well, and now it seems like you're kind of a, a jack of all trades. Like you're behind the camera, in front of the camera, on the stage, behind the stage. And building, <laughs> yeah. building sets. Well, Producing. so that was my internship was in technical theater. Yeah, so yeah. I do build a lot of sets now. Um, I've been the resident master carpenter at New Village Arts in Carlsbad for the last three shows they've done. Um, so that's been spectacular to get back to that work. I love that. And then as far as like we were talking about this before we started recording, but the whole producer thing, producership thing. I I ended up getting my graduate degree in business uh, from San Diego State when I came out here. So from Virginia, I went to New Orleans, was in New Orleans for a couple of years, uh, got into some TV producing there, like line producing. Um, and then uh, Hurricane Katrina happened and I evacuated and came out here. Um, and so I, I was going to school for business at the time, finished my degree in business. And I think because of that, um, and the artistic background, which for me also started musically, in fact, mm-hmm. um, and then, you know, became more poetry and writing and short stories and all that stuff through my undergraduate degree. Um, and then when I got the business mindset from studying, you know, uh, business at a graduate level, um, I think I just sort of, it just sort of, I, look, I, I've always said if, if, I, if me and my brother didn't look the same, I would have guessed that I was adopted, right? My whole family, like, has this really, like, logistical, very, like, statistical, what is that, right? Left brain? That's left brain, Left right? brain. So the very left brain in, in that. Even my brother is a musician, which is what he is. He's very mathematical about it. Like, so he's a really good drummer. He's a good composer, you know, but there's like a feel thing that is not quite like, you know, he's still trying to find that. I think these days he's better at it than it was before. But he's very mechanical. In a way. I mean, that, that's, that's the yeah. easiest way to it's say it. Technical. Technically yeah. proficient yeah. versus. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, um, and so, and then my, you know, my, my parents are, my father was an electrical engineer. So like that's. My dad was a nuclear engineer. So you can well, relate. My like, dad's I'm, an aeronautics engineer. Okay. So here we go. Right. So you felt like a fish out of water. Right. I mean, that's how, that was my experience, you know? So, um, but having grown up that way, but being, I think naturally, um, you know, creative, uh, and then getting the degree sort of got me to a place where, um, when people would bring things like Michael Foster brought his, his script to me and I read it and I was like for hush. for hush. Yeah. And, and I read it and I just started, I just started producing without even knowing that that's what I was doing. I was like, you should think about these actors. I've got, you know, these locations are great for this. And I think we should find a clawfoot tub and blah, 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 blah. And he was like, just produce this thing. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And he's like, actually, you know, that's what you're doing. So I kind of fell into the stuff that's sort of behind the scenes, you know, um, and I think the jack of all trades thing has just come from just 
wanting to make a life in this because because of those years that I lived for other people. Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to create your own work. That's totally. The, yeah, long and short of it, you have to yeah. be in charge of your work. A while back, she's like, I think you're just a really great producer. You're like, you're probably, it's probably the best thing you do. And I'm like, I only produce so I can direct stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like a necessity yeah. thing. I ended yeah. up producing because I wanted to be a director, not right. because I wanted to be a producer. Right, so right. It's like I'm desperately trying to find a producer to work with <laughs> on a regular basis so I can do less of that. Right, <laughs> you know, right. focus more on the directing. Well, right, you're a man after my own heart, a gypsy wearing lots of hats. <laughs> yeah, well, that's for sure. It does get uh, as you're telling your story of all the places you've lived. I'm like, huh. Yeah, that that sounds familiar. <laughs> You've done that. Huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so you know. Yeah. Getting to know Whitney has been like hearing somebody just keep opening new chapters to a book. Mm-hmm. I thought we were already past that section of the book. <laughs> right. It's like, oh no, no, there's more chapters. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> I tell him it's like, really? You don't I, I used to do pageants whenever I was in high school. That oh. one was the one where he's like Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, those are always uh, fun, weird quirky things do you have any either of you weird quirky things that people would be like really i totally do oh <laughs> please please <laughs> tell though. us you can't, right or are we talking about something else i don't know what you're talking <laughs> about <laughs> okay that i don't know if you, what's your quirky thing i was a child model <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah that i was awesome. on i was on a couple of talk shows with richard simmons <laughs> nice. wow yeah, as like a very small child like three or four years old Aw. Yeah. What did you model for? Like, Uh, so my godmother owned a children's apparel store in Detroit. And so I would do like runway shows for her after her buying trips abroad. (laughs) 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 Okay. (laughs) And so how does that get you? So runway shows in Detroit, how does that get you to Richard Simmons? I don't know. I was, I mean, I, so Cause there's a runway there. So I was, I, I was like <laughs> I mean, modeling. I don't know. I have a video somewhere in my parents' house where my father and I are wearing like matching sailor outfits and he's carrying me onto this talk show. I think that's it's really it's arrested called, development. Yeah, I know it's bizarre, right? <laughs> Kelly and company, which I think has been off the air since 1990, if not earlier. Um, yeah, You've it's got to put that shit on. <laughs> Please. Uh, if I can find it, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to examine it very closely first. <laughs> I imagine you would. <laughs> but, yeah, I know it exists somewhere. I don't know that I wow. do. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't believe you. Pro- I don't either. Is. That I mean, sounds well, false. What, like, give me an example. Like, <laughs> well, just things that, you know, because obviously in your life now, you're an actor, you're in film and theater. Right. What's something that's just, People wouldn't think, you know, like oh. I was the musical director for my acapella group in college. Oh, I totally buy that. Yeah, I would, I would buy that. I, I would yeah. buy that. I, mean, um, I was a swimmer. I was almost. I was actually at, at the Olympic level. Well, okay, there you go. That's okay. something that we wouldn't know about you. I was. To, I was. I was top uh, sixteen in the country. Wow, I knew you wow. swam. I didn't know you were that good. Yeah, I didn't have the tenacity for it. Mm. You know, like there's a certain yeah. place where you have to go mentally to just like live that life. I mean, Michael Phelps swims six hours a day. But he's also, isn't he like biologically developed yes. differently? So he was born to be a swimmer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so was he born to be a swimmer or did, his, or did his body develop that way because he was pushing it? No, he has well, like he some. he didn't start until he was about 11 years old or really? 10 or 11 yeah. years old, which is uh, ostensibly late. late. Yeah, yeah for yeah. exactly. Yeah, especially at that level. Yeah, he has yeah. some weird developmental thing with his muscles or something. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, I don't. Yeah, so that's like Jean Claude Van Damme. I think he actually took out like a pair of ribs so that he could do the splits for longer or something. Really? Yeah. I think that's what? one of those. Is that urban myths? <laughs> yeah. Urban myths. Well, I was very ready to you can only it, hear though. that you know that that Richard Gere gerbil story so often, and then yeah. it becomes true. I mean, know? it makes me think of the the food fighter guy. He actually has his stomach has a, a little flap that it expands Who's wider. This? The. the uh, he he was the Nathan's hot dog champion for like Oh, three that years. guy. Yes. Yeah, Kobayashi. Yeah, yeah. Kobayashi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, now, uh, that, he's a professional eater. That's yeah. actually a thing. Yeah. So but you know what? He works gross. out. He's like he's like a twig. He's he tiny, works out yeah. all the time. Yeah. And but he has this flap and it's, he he was born to be a professional eater because his stomach <laughs> expands like more than a human being should, like a snake or something. Uh-huh. 
Um, wow. There's I, a training for that too. Like there he is. trained for it. He did. And, and his technique is like outstanding. Uh, anyway. I saw a doc. <laughs> so cool. We're bonding over this. East Coast what? No kidding. Like, like he did, he doesn't eat everybody else until him. Everybody else would eat the hot dog the way you eat a hot dog. When he came around, he had a cup of water on one side and, and the hot dogs on the other. And he would take the hot dog out of the bun, break it in half, stuff the whole thing in his mouth, dip the, the bun in the water and then stuff the bun mm-hmm. in his mouth. And that was his so, technique. So like the bun, like essentially, is dissolved. Uh, it's totally uh, dissolved. Yeah. yeah, by the time it gets into your mouth, that's revolting. <laughs> <laughs> On a documentary, you ever had a damp. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> it's about the grossest thing you can eat. <laughs> I mean, really, shoving thirty of those or so in your mouth. Like, no, thank 30. you. He's more like sixty at yeah. the time. I think. Yeah. Did you watch a documentary about him where, like, when he was? Uh, Training, he goes into a sushi restaurant. It's one where you pay by the dish. He goes through a hundred dishes of sushi, mm-hmm. two pieces per plate. I'm like, good lord! It's fa- yeah, wow. he, he's a fascinating human being. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yes, back to you because you're a fascinating human being. What? <laughs> <laughs> she sounded really convinced. Yeah, I was segue, definitely though. convinced. <laughs> I feel very fascinating. <laughs> If that what? matters. <laughs> <laughs> what, what styles did you swim? Were you like a uh, relay or? Well, yeah. Butterfly? So, the, I, so our, the relay I was in was, uh, was top eight. Uh, but my, I myself was, uh, I was a, an I am mm. for a while. Um, I was the breaststroker, which is great. Um, <laughs> I just can't say it that way. And exactly. This is a different kind of breaststroking. <laughs> Um, uh, and a sprint freestyler. So I was the anchor, uh, relay swimmer. I anchored all the relays. Nice. Yeah. So there, that's something that we wouldn't have known about you or guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now we all know. Yes. I have a question about your notebook mm-hmm. growing up. What were you writing in your notebook? Really bad poetry. <laughs> like, See, because I carried bad. around a notebook all through high school and it was all broody and dark poetry. Yes, yes. Uh, we are or kindred really spirits. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, and or like it'll be pages of really bad poetry and then like a list of stuff I have to do and then like a really bizarre sort of beginning of a short story, very abstract and weird, and then more dark poetry. That's really what it looks like. Yeah. Do you still have that notebook? I don't have that. I have, I've gone through so many. I really, like, I genuinely always. She's reaching into her purse right now. Have a notebook with me, always. (laughs) Ooh, moleskin. Yeah, moleskin. (laughs) This is a new one. Anyway. It's blue, just so you guys can get a visual here. (laughs) It is blue. (laughs) <laughs> the reason I ask if you still have your notebooks from high school is uh, one of our guests, um, Joy Donzi. Joy Donzi, she went back and found her diary from high school, That's age awesome. thirteen, I think. Yeah, and she turned it into a one-woman play. That's really interesting. I actually She's been having a lot of success with. Yes, it. she has. Oh, That's good. Cool. Really I think good. they're going to Edinburgh actually with Very it. Very cool. So. Yeah, I went on. back. I have a box full of these notebooks. I, I went. I wrote a lot, a lot. So I've got probably. I don't know, 30 or 40 in a box in Detroit somewhere. And I went back, I was working on a young adult novel and I went back to look through it just to get the voice of a Mm. teenager back sort of in my Mm -hmm. brain a little bit. So I didn't take directly from, because it's, it should stay hidden. (laughs) Um, But, but I did, I did want to reference it to remember, oh yeah, this is what it felt like to have, to be in that mindset because I was writing for that audience. I found, uh, I, the summer after uh, I completed high school, I ran off to Alaska to work for a couple months on a boat, and I wrote a journal. While That's I was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it also happened to be the summer that I broke up with like my high school love, and so I went back recently to read the journal. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see what I was thinking while I was in Alaska. It's <laughs> all like, I miss her so much. Yeah. What was me? I see the sun setting and all I can think is it's the sunset of our love. And I'm like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> yes, like, you're, it's like a completely you. different person. It's like hilarious. looking back into the Why past. Didn't like you that? write about the whales. You saw whales. <laughs> yeah. No reference of the whales. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I'm like, you're in Alaska, yeah, bro. Yeah, must have been incredible. <laughs> I'm reading through the journal going, why didn't I write about Alaska? No landscape. There's nothing in here about Alaska. No icebergs. He heard some wolves no. howling, but then he just yeah. hoped that they would tear him to shreds. Oh, that That's horrible. hilarious. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, it is interesting to see how it, 
wildly different our perspective of the world. And is. thank God for that. But it's so <laughs> vastly different than it was when I was 16 years old. Ugh. So I wanted to ask you both because, I mean, you've been writing for such a long time. Um, has you, have you seen your technique change or does your technique change according to what you're writing about? Uh, talk a little bit about that. And then I'd love to hear about your technique for building a role. Sure. Yeah. So I think that my my technique has been slowly evolving, but it's also a project by project kind of thing. So for it, it also depends. Like I'm, I'm a big proponent of just finish a draft because you don't really know what you have until you have a completed first draft on the page in front of you. And so I will make myself just get to the end and then I can go back and rework it. And depending on what kind of shape it's in, my technique moving forward will change. So mostly it's like I word vomit as quickly as possible. And then I need to hear what I have because I don't know. I actually really don't know what's working. And this is true for um, books as well as plays for me. I have to if I'm if I've written a book, I have to read it out loud a little bit to see if the rhythm is working. And if it's a play, then I need to get it into the hands of actors because I really I don't know how broken it is. It's definitely broken, but I don't know how broken it is until I get some other voices in there. And also I just I writing can be such a solitary thing. It's it's a vital part of my process to get into a room with actors and get some feedback on it. What comes first for you? Do you come up with the characters or do you know the ending first? What's Oh, that's a good question. Usually it comes from character. Uh, I, I very rarely know anything except a general thematic concept and a person. That's usually the first thing that comes to me. In the case of To Fall in Love with Anyone, both of the it's just a two-person play, so both of the characters popped into my head fairly fully formed. Um, and then I knew that something terrible had happened to them because I don't, I don't really write happy stories. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is true. Yeah, so I knew Lots something terrible had happened to them, but I didn't know what until I got to it when I was writing that first draft. That's yeah, kind of cool. Of, yeah, just is it, did it just it popped out at you? You're like, oh, that's it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I was like, some, I was, because I thought to myself, okay, what these people love each other, but they're going to break up. So what is the worst thing I can think of? And so that's. Well, you say that, but I've read this thing now four or five times, and I can't even definitively say that they break up. Well, good, because I want it to be, I want people to come out of it wondering, like yeah, having differing opinions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in my head, they totally don't make it. Well, but. yeah, but that's I, what I love. <laughs> and it, this yeah. is something that I love about about your writing, Jenny, is that like I feel like you leave enough up to the audience to to decide those things. You know where, you know, and I got this from from True Romance. Tarantino's one of his first scripts. It's like I love to watch a movie and then go out with the people that I watch it or play and and have a piece of pie and talk about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. totally. Um, that's and, why I don't like going to movies alone. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I get that. People say that to me, like, why don't you just go watch movies by yourself? Why do you always drag up someone with you? Because I want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Who's watching the movie if I can't talk to somebody about it right after? Like, yeah, it's <laughs> such a social, it, well, it doesn't always have to be, right? Because I, I actually do go to the movies alone sometimes as well, but it just depends, I think, on mood and that kind of thing. Yeah. But ultimately, I do end up talking, even if I go to a movie alone, I still end up talking to a bunch of people about it. So that, that, that part of the experience is, is the social part, you know? Mm -hmm. What did you think? And I love that you you leave enough up to the audience and even the performers. I mean, there's so I mean, I guess that that segues into yeah, please. Yeah, <laughs> uh, what your question was for me, and that is, um, I think you know where 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 when we start to do what we're doing now, sit around a table and and read out loud, you know, do a table read of, of her work. That's where the development begins for for me in terms of, of character. And obviously, like if, if I have the script ahead of time, I get a chance to read it. Uh, before sitting down at the table and reading it out loud, which often happens. Um, and that's an overlap, too. So w as yeah. he starts to develop, I can then tweak it towards his right. ideas and his yeah, interpretation so I, I guess of it. I I'm calling it a table read, and really what it is is workshopping. Mm -hmm. So what, at least in our process together, me and Jenny and, and whomever else we work with, and, and, and I do want to say this now that it's come up, our director is Jacole Kitchen. Uh, and she was the director f also for September and Her Sisters. And, and she's fantastic. She is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And the, the the work that we do, I, I love that she's working with us again on this because we're really settling in, into this technique or this style of, mm -hmm. of development, which we're describing now. Um, so, you know, we sit around the table, we workshop it, we, talk, we read it out loud and we talk about it afterwards and the things that work. And we, we also have a dramaturg that's worked with us a couple of times as well. I'm super excited to have her involved too, Jessica Orden. Also fantastic. Yeah, it, absolutely. And, and so we, especially this being the third, you know, the third play, if you consider September and her sisters, mm -hmm. 
and then full part throttle. one and full throttle. <laughs> uh, you know, this being our third time going through the process, we've really sort of like leaned into it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, when we start to workshop it, it gives me the opportunity to really dig into not just the story, which is what the purpose is of doing a workshop for us. Uh, but I look at it from the perspective of whatever character, of course, I'm reading it from. So I, I can, you know, contribute in the in the workshopping of the story specifically with rega regard to that character or that character's moments or the things that I think are important. Um, so that's that's just sort of like a uh, an, an obvious thing. I think that the, the rest is sort of, you know, just bits and pieces of 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 instinct and and technique you know that i've learned over time um i i study a couple of different styles of technique um uh psychophysical physical emotional i've been in therapy for like six years you know like therapy, all of that therapy is a great way to learn how to build a character absolutely i mean if you yeah. don't somebody help you tear yourself down yeah to your base parts first mm -hmm. that's exactly help you re rebuild your own self yeah that's what you're doing with a character all the time. Absolutely. And in, 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 in some of the, the more emotional-based uh, techniques that I've studied, I, I feel in some ways that I'm in, like, uncontrolled therapy, <laughs> you know, where, where, like, certain things will come up. And if you don't know how to fucking deal with it, you know, good good teachers of these techniques will, will have said to us, this is not therapy. Like, you know, the, you will be dealing with very real emotional experiences. So if, you, if you're having trouble with that, you should go do that. Because it's good for us. It's good for all of us, you know. But, yeah, that, that helps a lot, I think, in, in developing an understanding, a full understanding of, of who a character is. Well, I think in the end we're, we're studying psyche. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's what character And motivation. Is, right? like, well, yeah, for sure. But, but the, makes into tick. the id of somebody. Yeah. And I've always thought so that, having too. Having been through some therapy, I think, helps. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I think, you know, that, that's, a, that's an emotional and psychological, like, you know, awareness of, of – yourself or of a character. Um, but in, in, in recent years, I've been, been really focusing a lot on the physical part of a character, which is another doorway, very She's interesting doing. doorway. Yeah. To get into a certain emotional experience. You can actually start an emotional experience from a physical perspective mm -hmm. or a physical standpoint. Some of my favorite actors I, I've come to realize are physically based actors and I never knew it like Tim Roth. That guy is so physically bizarre, mm -hmm. you know, and every character he creates has this very specific, like four rooms, yeah. you know, or lie to me. Like they these have ticks are very, and triggers. Yeah. And it's very Kurosawa-esque also. Like he was, Kurosawa was huge on having his actors develop some physical tick or physical sign or signature of that character so that if he had a wide shot with a bunch of people in it, the audience would know right away who to look at based on this movement that a particular character does through the whole movie. You know, it's like an unconscious way for an audience to, and not just an audience, but for the performer to, you know, to, to, to understand who this character is. Well, and that makes sense, like coming from Asian traditions and going back into their theatricality and things like that, that it would be so yeah. physically based. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what, so you said that you've studied a lot of techniques. What physical technique do you usually go to now yeah. that that's sort of your, your in or what you're playing with? Um, so mostly I use, um, there's a, a Michael Chekhov uh, developed a, a technique. Um, it's called the Chekhov technique aptly. Um, and uh, I, I use that a lot. I mean, I say that, and, but it's really a, like a, ho he's got a host of, of, of techniques um, that, that you can employ. Uh, but I remember like in September and her sisters, there was a moment where um, one of the characters that, that so I played a character whose girlfriend had uh, an abortion and um, I'm sorry, she didn't have an abortion. <laughs> she had a miscarriage. Uh, it was mistakenly uh, in her, in, uh the sisters, the sisters thought the sisters thought she had yeah. yeah an abortion but it turned out that she had a miscarriage and um and before that whole truth comes out on stage that it was it was actually between the, the first and second act um i had to get there i had to get to a place where i i remembered that experience of of being with this woman that i'm in love with that i you know that went through this horribly physically painful and emotionally excruciating experience um, so there, there was actually like a physical move that I, that I created that was about, you know, holding her on the floor, you know, as she's completely broken down, you know, and just trying to like, remember what that felt like, 
even though it never happened, of course, right? But this is the, how the imagination works. So so interesting. I didn't know you did that. Yeah, it was, and I did it every night. And there were I had different full body gestures that I would use before either certain scenes that were that were challenging for me because I either never had the experience or it was a scary place to go. You know that I would do these these you know these gestures to remind my body what it feels like to be in that case, you know, protective of somebody or loving of somebody who's broken, you know, that kind of thing. So it's so cool. I mean, they've done a lot of scientific studies on this. I just heard something on NPR like a couple weeks ago about how different poses will actually trigger different aspects of your brain. Like if you do the superwoman pose for three minutes, it works. Yeah. It triggers (laughs) the centers of your brain that are confident Mm -hmm. and, you know, outgoing. I like that when I'm directing so much. (laughs) (laughs) I've never noticed, but you do do that. Don't you? Well, it's like that basic, um, if you smile for a few minutes, you're going to feel happier. I mean, that's, it's most fun. Endorphins. (laughs) <laughs> I know it's so funny. I, I like the, the people talk about like, Af- to me, it's like the, the, there's a certain amount of this. That's just, if, if you, you like you accept the, the science of it, but there's also a papering over of the reality where like, if you use affirmations, like it works, but it works for like a couple of minutes, you know what I mean? So there's like, this is not, this yeah. is like a triage mm-hmm. or, right. you know, or like yeah. a way to get into a character. That's why it works. But like, I'm certainly not endorsing this as a way to live your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, it is, it is true. I do do the Superman pose when I'm directing, but I don't do it much, much in normal. Yeah. Stance. Do you think it, does it make you feel more confident? I think I just feel more confident when I'm directing. There you mm-hmm. go. My dad said once, because uh, he, he actually acted for me in a couple of films when I was in college. He said, watching me direct was the most fascinating thing because it's the only time in my life that he's ever seen me actually comfortable in my own skin. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a quite a statement. Yeah, it is. Yeah. He was he was very confused <laughs> when I <laughs> when I went into theater. He was even more confused when I went into concert lighting. And then I was like, I'm going to be a, a movie maker and he's like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> next? Something, you know, yeah. like what yeah, are yeah. you doing? And then I convinced him to come out and be in a couple of my films and yeah, I think it was like midway through an all night shoot on the second film that he was on. Mm-hmm. He was like yeah, you're doing the right thing. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Like finally, finally doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was he was hugely supportive after he after he watched me direct a little bit. That's awesome. But uh, yeah. Um. So this production that you're putting together now. Yeah. Um. It, it because it's a fringe piece. It's short. One act, yeah. It's, yeah, for it's about they, an hour. Do you, yeah. Do you yeah. like working in the one act structure, or do you prefer doing the full length plays? Yeah, I prefer. Well, the restriction has been a little bit of a challenge. Honestly, we had to cut. I think the first draft came in at like what was it, an hour fifteen, hour twenty, almost an hour twenty. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to cut a significant number of pages, and they were. I think. It's a tighter play now, but I there are beats that I miss for sure, yeah, me and too. it's challenging because I need it's very streamlined now. It's very very streamlined. There's not a whole lot of room to sit in a moment and to explore these people a little bit more deeply. Um, I think we've got a pretty solid draft that we're going to go into rehearsals with, and I'm hoping that we can find uh, a few more cuts just a few more to, to give us because we were at like 57 minutes yeah and there, <laughs> there, there are a few beats where there aren't um where there's no dialogue that that we can't compromise yeah mm-hmm. um so yeah so there, there we have to figure out Gotta how figure to out speed something. it up maybe some overlapping and yeah. by the way well, i'm I happy do, to hear that you don't want to cut the no dialogue scene yeah no those are too important so i think yeah. there's an impulse all oftentimes to like favor words over yeah. moments. Right. Right. And, and I mean, yeah, to, I be, to be, to be fair, it's really important for, for sure. sure. Yeah. To be fair to, to, to writing for stage, um, as a medium, it is a talking medium, whereas yeah. right. Whereas film is a, a visual medium. Um, but I think if you can earn those moments, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if, if the silence actually means something to the audience, then it's definitely, and that's something we obviously are shooting for. Yeah. Um, that's not something that we want to sacrifice. And, and I, 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 I want to also mention um, the other performer. I can't believe it's taking me this long to, to say it. <laughs> Sorry, Beth. Um, uh, Beth Gallagher is playing uh, opposite me. So, And she, I didn't know before this process, but she is perfect. For this role. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's absolutely perfect. So it's been 
it's been amazing to get to know her. And now that I'm rewriting it with her in the role, I'm rewriting it toward her voice and her rhythm. A little and she's bit, got so. a very obvious cadence. She does. She, she yeah. does. It's great. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's very unique to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some some video rolled across my Facebook today that she's in. Where she's yeah. The like a mom. Oh yeah, yeah I saw your that. Bev. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grab your bev. Yeah. 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 And I was I was watching that thing. Boy, she's just really unique. Like, yeah, she's honest. There's unique. an honesty there that that just is so refreshing. You know, she's just honest, and that's from a performer. And that's fearless. I feel like she goes places. She does. Yeah, she does. Like she yeah. just watching her. The little bit I've gotten to see her work with mm-hmm. the text. It's yeah, very the, raw. The way honest. that yeah, the way she describes. It, I've heard her say this a few times. Is in terms of the fearlessness. It's it's a, she she says you know it's allowing. Uh, allowing the th- the emotional experiences to happen to you despite yourself, not trying to get there. A lot of poor performers try to get to a place of sadness or a place of rage or a place of whatever. Um, and for her part, it, I think that's a, a really brilliant approach to yeah. it, where it's it's just more like you sort of have to let it happen to you. It just allows it to wash over her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and trying to swim out to. Yeah, and like I mean, because it's 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 so easy. It's not easy, but it's it's definitely easier to play the quality of of an emotional experience, you know. But to but we don't do that in real life. No, like, we try and conceal it. Exactly. Yeah. I had an instructor in graduate school that always said, "Never play drunk. Fight against playing drunk because you'd try and mask that. You wouldn't mm-hmm. want anybody to know. You'd be like, oh, 'Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine.' Mm-hmm. And I feel like that goes for most strong emotions. We mask a lot because. Mm-hmm. We don't want people in that part of our lives. So, right, right. yeah. I mask nothing. I'm an open book. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that Anybody totally makes sense. That's a huge fucking <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, what Whitney's saying is totally true. Like, we try to stifle stuff back. And I think oftentimes in performance, we forget that aspect of human nature. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love that that's. that's that's her go-to is, I mean, cause that's natural. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I guess that's the thing. Like knowing Beth, she's very thoughtful about people, you know? And so that's probably something that she picked up on just from existing. <laughs> yeah. 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 She has an awareness that's, that really lends itself to the character. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Sorry. I'm squeaking. I was wondering whose chair that was. Yeah. I thought it was me at first. <laughs> no, it's my But I was like, chair. I'm not moving and I still I'm hear nodding. <laughs> It might be both of us. Well, it might just be. It's just you. So, Eric, uh, I wanted to ask, since you are here today, we were just uh, talking about your other cohort. Uh, you're in a couple French shows, right? I am, yeah. So I'm doing To Fall in Love With Anyone, Do This. Um, and uh, I, I guess I, I never really said what I'm doing. So I, I'm producing it and I'm in it. Um, so, yes, and the other one I'm also producing. And I th- haven't seen the cast list yet, but I think I'm in it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm working with uh, Lydia Lea Real um, and uh, Tanika Baptiste and Ebony Muse on the newest iteration of uh, The Big Kitchen, uh, counterculture musical. And it's about um, the story of uh, uh, Judy Foreman, who is the owner of The Big Kitchen Cafe in Golden Hill, and uh, about their experience as a uh, cultural center and um, – an activist center and a sort of like, you know, just accepting of, of all cultures center, you know, particularly in the time where, where it was a new thing uh, back in the eighties when there was, you know, there was still quite a bit of uh, fringe, you know, people uh, who are not accepted or acceptable in our social construct. Um, she, she was really um, central in breaking down a lot of, uh, a lot of those issues, gay rights and civil rights and, you know, that kind of thing and fighting against nuclear empowerment and, and, and things of that nature and really creating a, a just an open community of, of people right here in Golden Hill. So this so. is almost like a, a docu musical because did yeah. you guys have to interview people or how did, so it's it actually about? something that's been in the works for a, a number of years. I think it's been five or six years. Uh, so this is just, this is the next step in that process. So, uh, Lydia and Tanika and I became, uh, cast members of the show three years ago for what was called a stage greeting, but was definitely way more than that at uh signet theater. 
And, uh, and then we did it for Fringe two years ago. Um, and that was a tough process, too, because it was a full-length show that we had to cut down. And same, same thing. Uh, but we were, we were cast members, and, and that was it. And then at a certain point, uh, Judy and some of the other people involved um, on the writing and producing level uh, decided that they needed to hand it off. So they passed the torch to Lydia, who, who brought uh, me, uh, Tanika, and Ebony on board to help with the, the cre- as the creative team. Um, so we're basically taking a structure or, or a story that exists. And yes, it is more like a docu-musical in, in that way. Um, there are definitely true stories and real people that are being portrayed uh, uh, in this story. Um, and we're taking all of that and, and just trying to take it to the next step, develop it um, to a, a wider general audience, uh, give it more of a dramatic arc, uh, more of a structure that, that you know, isn't just about fans of the big kitchen coming to see something that was turned into a musical about their story, but something that is more universal. Nice. Yeah. Wow, Lydia's life right now is all around docu theater because yeah. the what she and I are working on is also documentary based and right. interview based. So. Yeah, yeah, I hmm. love this. Yeah, hmm. <laughs> goes hand in hand. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Um, well, what else are you guys involved in? As if Fringe is not enough, right? Uh, well, I, I do want to say also just to tell everybody to keep their eyes open for we're actually cutting a trailer for this play. Oh, for to fall in love with anyone. Um, we've gotten most of our shots. I'm, in fact, that's where I'm going now. Michael and, uh, Michael Foster is directing it. Um, uh, I'm going to catch up with him to, to grab a few more shots today. And I think we'll be able to edit it by the end of the week. And um, just want to let you guys know to keep your eyes open on uh, To Fall in Love with Anyone. Do this is <laughs> Facebook page. Uh, and join us. Give us a like uh, as well while you're there so that you can kind of follow the rest of the news. Um, so that's something that we're, we're working on. We have a lot of it cut already. It's, a, uh, that's always been a joy to work with Michael in that way. Whenever we capture things, he, he's already editing as we, as we're filming. And so the rough it, cut looks so good. Yeah, oh my God. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what made you think that you want to turn this into a screenplay as seen? Actually, cuts it's, of this? it's funny. We, uh, we were all hanging out last weekend and I had had this notion in my head. I wanted to ask Michael if he thought, that it could be a movie. And when I got there, they were like, yeah, we were thinking about it anyway. And I was like, well, that answers that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was cool to, to, to find out that we'd come up with it separately. Yeah. You know? Um, so that, that is something that we're, we're looking at doing as well. Uh, so Beth is, um, well, I don't want to speak her news. She can speak her news, but I, she might be, um, uh, relatively unavailable after August or the beginning of August. Um, so we have kind of a deadline with this, but if we can adapt it, um, then uh, sometime in July we'll we'll be shooting to fall in love with anyone do this the film, awesome. Which is so thrilling because awesome. I've never made a movie before. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we're not there yet. Yeah, uh, that's this. This is our hope. You know, uh, we have to we have to be able to. to I mean, adapting a, a, a play to a, to a screenplay is 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 not something I've ever done. But Michael and I talk about it with Jenny about how we can open it up, you know, and, and, and find multiple locations and, and, and keep the story the same and figure out how to make it more visual, right? Because there's a lot of talking in it, of course, because it's a play, but um, how to do that, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So yeah, you guys are going to be pretty busy for the rest of the summer. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, for our audience, where can they go to find dates of both shows and any future things going on and so on and so forth? Tickets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, you go ahead. You made it. <laughs> I just you're... feel like I've been talking too no, much. No, no. Um, so to fall in love with anyone do this has a Facebook page. Okay. And we're posting information there. Um, and the Big Kitchen, of course, will be doing the same thing. Um, so uh, we'll have the poster um, is 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 going to have all that, you know, all the dates and, and location information. But I can also tell you guys now. Um because I don't remember the actual dates. But we're performing to fall in love with anyone at um, – San Diego Art Institute's, what do they call it? The space, the artistic space or something yeah. like that, right? In Horton Plaza, the pop-up space. Are they calling it the pop-up space? That's what it's called generally, but they have a name for it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a pop-up space that they have in Horton Plaza. And it's um, it's right next to Victoria's Secret, which I find <laughs> fun. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's actually in the mall. Um Let's see. And I'm just looking up the dates now for the show. So the show to fall in love with anyone is um, Thursday, June 22nd at 730. 
uh, Monday, June 26th at 2.30, Tuesday, June 27th at 9, Wednesday, June 28th at 4, and Thursday, June 29th at 4. Um, so, and I think the, the way the Fringe Festival works is if I, I'm sure somebody's talked about it on one of your other interviews, but you have to get a tag. Mm-hmm. So the Fringe, that's how Fringe makes their money. It's $5 basically so that you can buy tickets to see a show and the shows are a flat rate of $10. So but then uh, someone else mentioned that they also have packages. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And uh, all tickets are on sdfringe.org slash tickets. And yeah, thank you for that. Um, and of course, the, the, the reason the Fringe has you buy a tag is so that they can keep doing what they do, which is offering a, you know, a space and a place for us to do this. And marketing. And marketing, marketing, exactly. And and so all of the ticket sales go to the artists. Mm-hmm. So we would love you know the support because our, our, our one of our plans is to take this to other fringe festivals as well. So in order for us to do that, you know, we, we'd have to to get some some have have a good showing here. Some butts yeah. and seats. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we struggle, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. And that's the yeah, that's marketing, you know, that's just creating a good message, which is easy to do with Jenny's work. So oh, well, thank you. Yeah. The tags are cool too though. Like they, they are cool, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. still have fringe buttons from whenever I lived in Kansas City. All fringe tends to have really cool artwork and things. Yeah. Yeah. Did they do it over there like they do here? Like a like um dog like tag. it looks like a dog tag? Mm-hmm. Uh so ours were like pin buttons that you uh, could just attach to your backpack or shirt. Or I wonder if they did that because this is a military town. Oh yeah. that's an interesting it must be, yeah. 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 That's yeah. cool. Yeah. It would make sense to kind of tailor them for the different cities. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. It's an interesting question to ask the fringe organizers. Yeah. We should try and get some fringe organizers on the show. We we can probably accomplish that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> right on. Um, what about your personal stuff? Where, 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 you have a personal website or anything? Oh, yeah. It's ericcasolini.com. Um, I don't update it as much as I should. So uh, Eric Casolini – on Facebook, and it's uh, all single letters, no doubles. And mine is jennifer-lane.net, and I do update it fairly regularly. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. So guys, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you. Luck, uh, break Thanks. a leg, all the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, make sure you guys are going to the Fringe Festival shows this summer. It's sdfringe.org slash tickets. Um, get your dog tag and buy a bunch of tickets and go see a bunch of shows. Um, I will do my best to see as many as I can. And, you know, they're all downtown. So if you want to grab a cocktail before or after, make a night of it, it's a good time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks again. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, guys. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck, telling you please, talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. Intellectual Podcast.